Is that not? OK, that's better. All right, I apologize. I stopped coding for a while, so I'm no longer like technically savvy anymore. So first, the uh, public service announcement. Um, so later today, the, uh, we, the people in the Jenkins community are meeting at the H3242. So, so if you're interested in meeting the rest of the community, be there, um, and then we have fun. So, um, so today, I kind of wanted to talk about, I guess, a bit of my experience of you know, going from an uh, open source hacker to sort of you know, company around this effort in the hope that it will kind of help those of you who are thinking about you know, the similar journey at some point. So I'm a, so I'm a hacker. You know, I created this project called uh, Hudson. Uh, that was uh, you know, the con continuous integration server while I was working at this company at, called Sun Microsystems, which some of you might already not know, which is kind of a little bit sad. Um, and uh, this project became Jenkins. Uh, and then uh, at around the same time, I left uh, Oracle. It didn't take long for me to discover that Oracle is not my company, um, which, that, which speaks more about myself, not about Oracle. Just, just so you know. Um, and then I started this company uh, to build a business around uh, the Jenkins project. And then it kind of really quickly joined hands together with the CloudBeats. And then now I'm working as the CTO of CloudBeats. So Jenkins, you know, it's, uh, at this point, it's this, uh, right now, it's probably the um, best described as the open source automation server. So people use it to do all kinds of you know, software development automation work, to batch processing, to even monitoring a nanny cam, which is like one of the most exotic use cases that I've heard about it. Uh, and then it has the quarter of a million uh, installations that we track around the world. And then they are collectively driving almost close to one million computers to drive a lot of, again, these workloads. So, I'm kind of uh, responsible in a small way for the uh, climate change because all these computers like, are generating heat, <laughs> right? Um, that's not great. Uh, but everything else is great. Um, so we estimate you know, the, pro the users in the order of millions. So this, is a, you know, this became a pretty big project. Um, and so Club is it's a company, I guess, behind Jenkins is a bit of, bit of a different, difficult statement. And I'm going to get to that a little later. But it has a, we have a lot of expertise around DevOps and Jenkins, and we help people sort of drive this continuous slavery project or the DevOps initiatives at the enterprise. Um, and we have this, like a, you know, the, the, pro, uh, the product, the support, some of which I'm going to talk more about the details. Um, and then last but certainly not least, by doing all these activities, we can hire people who work on the Jenkins project to push their foot forward. And in this context, like, that's the Part of, part of it that really makes me proud. Um, so the reason this talk is called Hackers Gotta Eat is, you know, like we got to earn some bread on the table, right? I mean, the, especially after the sun went down the tube, like it really left a strong impression on me that having a good technology is not enough. You have to, in order to make a big enough impact to the world, you have to create the sustaining, sustainable model. And when you can bring the money to the table, that opens up a lot of possibility of how to sustain the project. So, you know, that basically comes down to making money. So I don't feel about that as ashamed as at one point I used to be. So I wanted to talk about some of the different models that the people have pursued um, and we have also pursued. So the first one I'm going to mention is uh, professional services. Um, so the idea here is, you know, so you, you or like a, some, some number of the contributors that you hire as employees as you go out and then you provide your services. So you show up in person, maybe consult on something, write some code together, help them like, uh, fix problems, whatever. And then you charge for the money. So, um, so this was really great in the early on. So this was the very first thing I took on with another guy. Um, and then you know, by then, the product was kind of reasonably well known, right? So people already knew who I was. And then it wasn't very difficult to land a few gigs like that. And then I also gained this very up close experience about how people use our software in the real world. Now, in my case, I was the user of my own software long before like, I just turned into the full-time gig. Um, so I knew, like, where the sudden, I, I knew something about how this was used, but it was always interesting to see the wholly different environment, like an entirely different company 
using my own software. And then that gives you a lot of thoughts about what needed to be done. So more than money was helpful in like, uh, getting the direction of the project in the right way. So, um, and then this you know, consulting work, it doesn't really require any huge upfront investment. You basically just need to jump up and down and say, hey, like I'm ready to take your money, and then some people will basically show up. That's as it, that's, it's that easy, especially in Adio. Now, when you get bigger, like, uh, things would obviously change. Um, but uh, the next one I kind of wanted to talk about is training. So you know, this should be also pretty obvious, right? So the key idea is you, know, you teach people how to use your software or how to run them. And uh, you know, it does require some upfront investment, as in, like in order to do a training, you have to create some materials, labs, you have to figure out some logistics, like how to get the venue, and you know, some level of marketing is necessary and all that. But still, this was, in the grand scheme of things, pretty easy thing to get started, right? The, you, know, you already know a lot about the software you produce. And it's surprisingly more crappy than you think it is. So people need a lot of information about how to use it effectively. Um, so that was, in fact, for me, like one of the key like a benefit of doing this was, as you are writing the training materials, you get to see how your software is coming across to users. And you feel like, oh, this is not great. Like, I got to fix the software so that I can write this part of the training materials a little better. And that feedback loop was kind of really useful. And once you hit the classroom, like it repeats, the process it repeats again, right? So you have a lab, and then like you watch people struggle behind your shoulders, and you get a lot of insight about, oh, this is how they get stuck, right? And like they, the system produces some weird error messages, and like people are like really struggling how to get more, and you get a, like a very like an insightful view into different use cases in, in much more scalable ways than the uh, professional services. So. Um, so that was really great. My training also like, you know, can produce a fairly significant revenue for the amount of time you need to put in. Like, so that you show up for the one-day training, and you have 10 people, say, charging for 2K each, so that's already 20K. Now, you can't do that 365 days a year. Like, there won't be enough people who want to be trained like that. But still, if you're trying to combine this, let's say, you know, uh, save some time to build the product, then this is kind of like a nice combination. So um, early on, like I, I, you know, I was, uh, I did, you know, I, I, I did, um, I, I, did, I did the training myself, and then enough to the point of like, at some point, my, my brain would like a stop, like a switch to this automatic mode, and I can just talk about whatever in this next chapter without even thinking about it. And then so um, that, that, that part of like a repetition start to kind of little. You know, um, uh, made it little, like made myself a little less motivated over the period of time. But early on, it really was great. Um, and also, you get a lot of conversation going with the people coming. And that's almost like a half the value they are getting is not just the tra training manuals, but the fact that you know, they can engage with well, all sorts of like, you know, the conversation. And they describe the challenges they have. And then again, those things really help you calibrate what problems in, like, in the space that your software could solve. And then that leads to um, the, another common thing that you can do, which is the enterprise product. So the challenge is the training and professional services like, fundamentally does not scale, right? Every time you deliver something, you got to do put in some work. Um, the product is the sort of a first more scalable thing. So you can build something once and then sell multiple times. Um, but so, so it's kind of like obvious destination that, that, that we all head to at some point. But like I also discovered that this is a very interesting challenge is work. So um, you know, open source, I was, uh, back, uh, I was more used to the idea of, well, let's just put the code out there. And then you know, people, people who know what they're doing is going to look at that, and they grok the idea and then they start using it, right? That's kind of like a how the good open source software spread, which is like a words to words, uh, words of mouth between developers in you know, occasions like this. Now, enterprise software does not sell for itself, especially when you have a competitor called the open source project that's just as great and it's completely free, right? So you need this like a salespeople, and that's a different beast than, um, 
you know, you also as an open source guy, like that was something like like I had like a zero experience on. So uh, in my case, it was like a, I was very lucky to kind of join hands with the forces of the Krabbies, where like they, you know, but even back then, we like Krabbies built a small enterprise sales arm, and then over the period, they, so that was 2011, and now it's eight years forward. Um, you really see, like I really saw how the sales org has grown, not just in size, but how they approach the problem of selling. And that's been kind of fascinating. And it really made me appreciate about, oh, this is an art of its own. And it's better to bring the right people. But anyway, the point is that you need these folks. Um, and also, in order to sell a credible product, you kind of need some critical mass of features and stories. And that's sort of really early on, it was difficult. Um, so very first features that I implemented that eventually kind of became the foundation of the enterprise product, they did it through the, um, the, consult the professional services. So I was able to find this arrangement where somebody wanted their problem to be solved, uh, but they were willing to let me keep the, uh, the IP. So I could keep the code and I can sell it elsewhere, basically. That was the idea. Um, so I didn't do professional services myself long enough to see if that's a common setup or not, but uh, I'm still very grateful that that person who kind of let me solve this first bootstrap problem. Um, now, if you can raise the money and so on, that's less of a problem and so on. So there are other ways to work around that kind of things. But I really enjoyed that, that you know, the, being able to build something, knowing that this already solves somebody's problem, because often that's kind of hard thing. Like you think, you feel like, and some people must need these features, but you never really actually know that. And in the open source project, you kind of, you have a ways of like validating and course correcting throughout the development, but proprietary product is not like that. If you're selling it, they expect the software to meet certain quality from day one. That means like the point in which you can discover when the feature is crap is actually pretty late in the game. Um, then as the effort kind of gets bigger, the, the next sort of challenge was how to like a drive a defensible, clear line between what happens in the open source and what happens in the product. Um, in part because you know your open source product is like a thriving and happy. There are contributors implementing feature left and right. So if you end up picking the proprietary space that's too close to the open source, then what's going to happen is the community people will think, oh, that's a great idea. Let's implement this. And then like they, they suddenly some of the features material in the, in the open source. Or um, the, in the other cases, you, like, there are certain things only you can do, but um, again, if that's close, too close to the software that's in open source, it can come across as you are sort of like sucking the oxygen out of the open source project by intentionally not letting that go into this space because you're trying to keep it in the enterprise product. And that could create like a trust problem, or in the worst case, it could make to prevent the software from base open source software from getting improved sufficiently, and then you lose against the competition in the open source space. So there are these challenges like that. Um, the other thing we kind of got early on that I didn't like appreciate the importance was instead of charging it once, uh, like you gotta really like nowadays you gotta really charge for the subscription, meaning like every recurring money per year. Um, and then that sort of changes, it's not just about how you charge the money, but it really creates the entirely separate motivations and like emotion around sales and how do you make your customers happy, how do you license, how do you price them, etc. cetera. So um, this, I think it, nowadays uh, um, it's, not, it's more and more common. People are used to that idea, thanks to companies like Adobe you know, pushing that. But early on, this was still pretty high friction thing. Um, and last, but not I th actually, the, then the next one that I wanted to talk about is support, like a software as a service. This also is pretty obvious one, right? Like you produce a software, it's great. So you help people run it by taking on that responsibility on you. It's a very easy to understand. To, it's a very easy to understand model. And there's also inherent economy of scale if you start hosting lots of people. So that's how you kind of create the margin to make money. Now, um, but there, this is also kind of like a tricky, um, there's always people, especially early adapter of open source projects, they, they, you know, they tend to, they, they have people who can control more of their time, 
but they don't really always have the control of the money. So the trade-off that's going on in their head is, well, I can run this service on my own, or I got to ask my boss to cough up you know, X amount of money. And that often, they, they don't make the right trade-off, like a right, right judgment call for the organization. So there's all, you have to kind of always fight against that, and then that also creates this upper bound in how much you can charge. Um, and uh, it also, in case of the like, software Jenkins, right, this is fundamentally more customizable for individual user. So the scale of the econ like economy of scale, for, in our case, was really hard to achieve. Now, some other projects are not like that, so then they are good. But there's always this tug of war between um, needing to customize against individual users versus trying to run the uniform things as widely as possible for the better economy of scale. Um, and then nowadays, obviously, the problem with this is that the, you know, the, if you are really successful, then Amazon did come over, hey, you got a nice cake over there, let me have it. Yeah. Um, now, I, in some sense, it's like a great, it, it's a sign of success. So I don't necessarily mean it as a problem, and it only shows up at the ferry down, you know, ferry down the road. So you have enough time to build some other, you know, uh, the competitive advantage and so on. But, but I guess in this current climate, I, I, I felt like I got to mention that. So next one, I think the last one I wanted to cover is support. So you know, I think, again, this is also a very obvious concept. You know, you're providing not the software as a service, but the expert expertise as a service. Um, so the, these things are really helpful for the larger organizations in ways that I originally didn't understand. Um, but it also kind of naturally complements this typical shortcomings of open source project, which is, again, you have a bit but most often, like, you, don't really, you don't do enough job on explaining how to use that software or, like, or how best that should be used or how to enable lots of people to effectively use that project. So support, it kind of nicely complements them. And as a result, what it does is it really drives the adoption of the software at a larger scale in the bigger organizations. So open source projects, again, tend to be adapted in a bottom-up manner. So, right? so if you imagine if you had like a you know, 5,000 developer company like, um, um, well, I don't know, let's say IBM, well, then 50,000 companies, so, right? Then it's usually the open source project happens in ways where like a, one guy in the team just decides to install that on their computer or like run it on their EC2 account, and then that's it. So it's sort of like an isolated effort at different pockets of the world, which is kind of not very nice for the larger organizations. So what they are always, often trying to do is, well, let's figure out how to make this like a, you know, the really widely like a, um, applicable for the entire organizations, and that needs this, this second line help, that needs training, certification, and that, those are the kind of things that are actually pretty like a lucrative for commercial business around open source in ways that really help the open source project. So, um, so the support was useful, but uh, this is often also kind of like the hardest one to launch, right? So um, you need a, like, you know, if, when I was just doing this with me and another buddy, like, I can't really claim that like, we have a credible support. Like, I didn't want to be waking up by, like, a 4 a.m. because somebody in the India was having a problem. So it took uh, the larger organization, people around the world, and some processes and all that stuff to, to do it. So it's an art of its own, again. Um, and then you have to also, you know, hire the people with the right expertise or figure out a way to train them. All right, so that's kind of like a different um, business models and some of the, so in, actually, if I move on, we did, at Club is we did all that, right? And then all, all of these things kind of help each other, or like your emphasis shift from one to the other as a company or the project gets bigger. Um, so I think you'll, you'll find some of these combinations, in, perhaps in different combinations useful for you, but these are the key ingredients. So, Another thing I kind of learned a lot about this interaction between the open source project and the company is around people, right? Because they, you know, we, in the community, we are in the community dev room, so we understand the importance of the people who push the project forward. It's the same with the company. And then when you try to build a company around open source projects, what often you do is to hire people from the project, right? That's where you know the good qualified people. Um, and uh, you, know, you already know, you don't need to train them because they already know your code base. Uh, they already share your mission. So like a, a lot of what needs to be filtered out is already happening. So that's super convenient. Um, 
Now, the second point, and then, you know, people, you already know how to work with people, which is actually true and false in some sense, like a sense, some fascinating way, but I don't have enough time to talk about that today, unfortunately. Um, so, and then, you know, employing these people, because they already, like, believe in the, like, a passion and the mission of the project, what that enables you is, like, they can sort of, like, translate that passion into make a bigger impact, like, you know, these people say, sometimes we hire people who are only working in the project as a weekend spare time thing, right? So, and then when, when you can sort of help them and uplift them from that, that spot to be able to work on the project full time, they can do like, you know, five times, 10x more impact. So that's really valuable. Um, and then the other nice, nice thing that I saw happen is like, these are often like a local Jenkins champion in the company. And when we bring them over, their, their boss is like, oh, no crap, like, okay, the guy who's been running Jenkins for me is gone. I guess I need to buy the support. So not only I get the employee, but he brings the sales lead. It's like a great, like, you know, it's double whammy. Um, now, that said, you know, the hiring people from the project, that's come with the challenges. So sometimes, um, because they're so passionate about the project, there is a boundary between, like, how much is the company's work and then how much is, like, they are working on some things that the company doesn't really care about, but they personally care about. It could become, that, that somebody has to think like that can get really painful. And or the other people in the company, you know, it's, it becomes really unclear, okay, so this guy is, or in, you know, this guy, employee of a company, is working on this project, so I'm gonna ask for them to do more. But it turns out that the guy is actually not working on it as a day job, it's just that he's like, we can passion plug in or something. And then, uh, so that created some friction like that. Um, and then it's also not really healthy if you start to occupy, say, like a more and more contributor base into the single company. So suddenly what felt like a level playing field is now like a suddenly lopsided into one big guy and lots of small folks, and that creates a tension in the project. Um, and then every time you put out somebody, I mean, this is kind of a cruel way to say it, but. When they are working outside the company, we were not paying them anything and they are still contribute to the project. We brought them on board, now we are paying them, and then so we kind of lose out in sense that they sort of getting a free labor, right, that they're sponsored by other parts of the, uh, the world. So that's also not quite healthy. So over time, it's kind of, well, um, let's see. Uh, so yes, um, so, over time, what happens is, um, well, actually, um, let, me, let me just move on here. Um, so then the, the fact that when this company gets a little bigger, it sort of creates more, like a certain dynamism around how to interact with the project. So we wanted to create more like a smoother boundaries between the people who know how to interface with the project and the rest of the company who may or may not have the open source background, which is the kind of thing that happens when a company gets bigger. Um, and it also like try to be more on the same page. Like it's kind of embarrassing if I say, if I kind of go out in the community and hey, like we think it should, we should do this, and another another like, employee from the company says, oh, that's a horrible idea. Then like sort of like you know, we, both of us kind of lose the credibility. So having some opportunity to like a, like a discuss like what we are trying to drive in the community, get the feedback, or like you know, do the next, some, have some conversation to adjust the course so that everyone is happy. That's sort of being a part of the viable cycle. Um, and now when things get bigger, the other things change. So for example, the you know, open source DNA, like you know, the originally when I was hiring everyone from the same community, we kind of naturally bring people who feel the same, who feel and think the same way. But as the company gets bigger, obviously you start hiring other job, job functions, people from outside the community, and that will move your sort of you can't really take the like, open source DNA for granted. And then it doesn't mean, or the even worse case is, there are other people who does other open source projects in different ways, and then they, we, you feel like they have open source DNA, but they, we, you, know, you and them mean different things. So it requires more conscious care and maintenance. On the other hand, every time, like, any time you have this project or any community, it develops a certain kind of group thing because it's a self-filtering process, right? And then the fact that the people feel, think the same way 
makes them blind to certain kind of risk or the opportunity, etc. And then like, when we talk about the diversity, importance of diversity in the community, that's what we like, are really trying to address, right? We want to make sure that the people are looking at the different things and feel the different ways so that the important idea, so like a signal not, doesn't get lost. Um, so this was in some sense like, really, really rewarding by having people from different backgrounds, people from outside, people who do different languages, designers, people writing technical documentation. This, everyone brought in this new perspective. Um, and, uh, but um, and also as the company kind of gets bigger, the internal contributors need to be treated more like external contributors, like because you can't really assume, like you can't really command, right? So the thing with you when you're working is open source projects, you can't command them to do something. You have to think about their incentives, how to encourage them to do more, how to help them feel successful. And all of that is very much true, even if you're working for the same company. And that's become more pronounced uh, when it gets bigger. So, um, so I spend too much time talking about stuff, so I'm gonna kind of skip a bunch of stuff. So all of this, like, you know, you might be feeling, wow, it's kind of complicated. And it is complicated and it is a little painful. It's also like a worrisome amount of time. Right? So why is, like, is it worse? Why, is it, why bother? Like, why is it worth doing? So I think, well, it's kind of like uh, speaking to the core. I mean, the, you're already in this mindset, I'm sure. But I sort of fundamentally believe that the open source is eating the world. Like, it is the way, like, I think we have proven to the world that this is the better way to develop software. And then so more and more organizations, I think, are getting the idea that this is how you need to like, develop the software. Um, so in order to solve bigger and better problems in open source, because today we mostly rely on people's goodwill, their spare time, their employee, or they're both being like a very friendly in order to push the project forward, right? But that, only, that, that really only can take you so much. So by building this commercial activity around, by using that money to fund the development, and then, for example, one thing it allows us to do is to bring a different skill set to the table. So Jenkins project traditionally had a lot of Java developers, but we didn't really have any design people, and that showed in the software. So one of the things that the club is able to do, thank you, yes, so those of you, <laughs> oh, this, this hurt more than I thought, but uh, um, uh, so what was I saying? Yeah, so uh, the company was able to hire the designer to work in the project, which did not naturally happen, again, partly because of the group think and all that thing. So, and so that was one great project. Similar thing about the technical writer, et cetera. So to be able to bring those other skill sets to the table, to be able to push the project forward, to be able to make the project more credible in the eyes of large organization, people behind the curve, and those are all have a positive influence to the project. So I think, you know, I think it's a really worthwhile endeavor because we all have to eat, right? Because what it means, like the open source, because open source software is valuable, it's worth doing more of, but people's time is also valuable. So in order to get their time, you gotta figure a way to make it sustainable. So on that note, I think I'm kind of at the end of, I think I run out of time almost. So I, that's kind of the end of it for my talk. And then just one more public service announcement for, for PM. And then t-shirts, t-shirts, yes, this is important. So you can, Great, okay, yeah. great. Questions, folks? One, two, I will bring you a mic. It will be amazing. So please come front at the end to pick up the awesome Jenkins X t shirts. Oh, I should throw them, huh? Is that okay? It's totally fine. All right. All right. Exercise, caution, t shirts in flight. Ah, well, the rest, I think, to be fair to the people in the back, I, I'll keep the rest in here. <laughs> Am I amazing? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding open source in a project which are focusing on products which are not for other developers like Jenkins, or, but for projects, let's say, uh, for plumbers, for small business owners, for accountants, for farmers, where they actually uh, they are not involved in it. Would you somehow advise maybe new business models or something more specific for those kind of projects? Well, yeah, so I guess the question is like, if my domain is not targeting the other developers, like what about it? So I, I, that's a great question because I think about that sometimes. 
my sense is, obviously I don't have any experience, but my sense is these projects do not get done as open source projects, right? Because you don't really get like other plumbers to join, oh, like this is a great software. I'm going to improve this software by hacking the code. They don't do that. So I feel like they are better suited for the proprietary software and kind of avoid the problem.